Jenny Pell is a permaculture architect. She does this for a living. She came all the way down from Seattle to be here with us. So please welcome Jenny Pell. Okay, so thanks all you folks who were here all the way to the end. And I'm going to take you through a little um, ride through Jenny's life and kind of some of the projects that I work on. I'm going to focus on the food forest in Seattle, but also give an overview of some of the urban permaculture projects that I work on. So really quickly, permaculture is a design approach. It's a design methodology so that we can have resilient human habitats. And what I'm trying to do is help people live really large on a very small footprint. We can't continue to live enormously on an enormous footprint. It's just not sustainable in any way, shape, or form. So we have to look at the hyperlocal. We have to be able to bring skills into our community. We have to have neighbors and friends and family, each embodying a very important skill in our neighborhood, whether it's child care or storytelling or growing food or saving seed or natural building. Right? We, have to, we have to start to aggregate these skills in all our neighborhoods so that we can have a resilient future. Just for transparency, my peakometer is pegged. I think the shift is on and I think things will happen very quickly from this moment forward. I think the global economic system is on the brink of some very enormous changes. I'm not gonna say good or bad. I think it's, it, I would like to see gas at $10 a gallon. If we had gas at $10 a gallon, our food, our heating, our cooling, our cars, our transport, our building materials, everything would be kind of prohibitive at that level. So what will we do in a $10 an hour scenario for gas, I mean $10 a gallon scenario for gas. So we have to start looking at these bigger equations and how do we solve those solutions within our own local communities. So I'm just gonna launch into a slideshow and please, please ask questions while we're on our way. So um, do you wanna cue the, oh there you go, okay, so here we go. <clears throat> yeah, if you wanna ask a question, please use the mic. So there were even trees and gardens on the rooftops of city office buildings. So why is it that we have these incredible structures that we're not using to grow food and create spaces to hang out? You know, how do we turn spaces into places? How do we take these little eddies of human life and make them accessible to people in a way that we can also hang out with our friends and family, that we can grow food, that we can have pollinator pathways, that we can have um, built-in natural filtration systems in our city? So this is, a, I'm gonna have quite a lot of pictures to get through, so just hang in there. Okay, so this is in Seville. Why can't we have fruit growing on our streets, right? Who doesn't want to eat fresh oranges on the trees right on their streets, right? So in the cities, we have what's called the, the heat island effect. It gets warmer in the cities. All that concrete absorbs the heat and the thermal mass and then reflects that heat back out. So in Seattle, we can grow peaches and apricots in little microclimates in the city, right? It's pretty cool, right? So here you have, you know, um, in Seattle, for example, there used to be ordinances that didn't allow you to grow fruit on the streets because those plums might land on your car. And who doesn't want a, who wants a plum on their car? Right? So like we're, we're deferring our, our own health and nutrition to the cars. Okay, I'm done with that. All right? I, so I am working with the city to help legalize, for example, growing food in the planting strips. So in the year 2010, we had the year of urban agriculture in Seattle, and one of the new laws that they passed is that you can grow food in your planting strip. And you can sell food that you grow in your backyard and in your planting strip and seeds and other value-added products. Okay, so this is a building in um, Vienna, I believe. This is by a famous architect named Hunter Wasser, and he was an artist and an architect. And this building is... Um, a well-loved and well-visited place that has cafes, apartments, public transport in the bottom. If I were a bird, that's where I'd be hanging out in the city, right? And so for me, the architect's job is to like provide the bones and the structures of the buildings so that I can go in and plant the trees on the top. Right? So I don't want to work with an architect who's building this soaring, gorgeous, tall building where I'm like this big in the landscape. I want to feel like I fit in and belong in that landscape. And I want that architect to work with me from a whole systems perspective so that I can grow plants, have habitat, have beautiful spots to hang out, <clears throat> create areas that are well-loved in our community and are growing food and, 
and that they're integrating those water systems, and we're looking at it from a whole systems perspective. I often work with architects and developers, and they, they design the building, and then they say, well, fill in your little landscape around the edges. I'm like, that's not, a, that's not a holistic approach that we need to be embracing at this stage, okay? Here's another Hunterdwasser um, apartment building. This is a whole city block. Okay, so um, all of the rooftop is accessible with, you can see little gazebos and places where can, people can hang out. At the very top of that um, green roof is a cafe and a bar, right? The parking lot is underground and there's little alcoves that you can walk through that take you to the middle. Well, what's going on in the middle of that, parking, of that apartment building? The party. There's a playground and a pond and it's a microclimate that heats up Right? If you think the sun coming into that spot, so they can grow really unique varieties of beautiful things as well as edible things. Right? So as a permaculture designer, I'm always looking at where's the microclimate that's going to let me do the different thing. Whether it's I want to grow an olive tree or I want to have a pomegranate or it's cooler and shadier so I'm going to grow my greens in that spot. So I'm trying to integrate everything from roof water catchment and gray water systems that are going to flow through my garden, attached solar greenhouses, and how do I integrate that? How do I have my shower in the attached solar greenhouse and then that gray water goes through and then waters my plants, right? So I'm looking at all the different systems. But Hunterdwasser, I find a great inspiration. You don't have to build things in linear, straight, boxy, um, little you know, boxes that we live in. It's not natural. I don't feel comfortable in those spaces. Those dead corners are, you know, energy sinks, right? So how do we curve those edges? How do we, how do we think of our designs in a way that really embrace our, our humanness, right? So the feng shui, we look at that a lot. Okay, here's a rooftop garden. So I look at, you know, young people in the city who are looking for jobs and why aren't we just growing food in the city? There's tons of spaces to do that. I think there are maybe a few places in China that grow a, maybe two or three percent of what they eat in the city within the city limits. Really, there's no other place in the world. Maybe Havana is up there in Cuba. Well, what would our cities look like if we grew one percent of what we ate within our city limits? What would it look like? It would look like this, right? What would our cities look like if we grew five percent of what we ate within our city limits? We'd have trellises of kiwis and grapes, and we'd have all kinds of, like, we'd have food in the back and front yards. We'd have city hall growing food. We'd have, all along the alleys, we'd have berries that we could pick, right? But it wouldn't be just the food. You can't have a complex food system and a complex structure like that without the complex social structure to complement it, which means you have to have a skill, and you have to have a skill, and you have to have a skill, right? We all have to be bringing something to that table to be able to do that. You can't just plant it and have it just pay, take care of itself, right? So this is a subway in Tokyo, and those are grapes. Why don't all of our entries, entryways and subways look like this? So I always see these beautiful shots and wonder why is it the only one, right? So somebody's job is to maintain those grapes, right? Somebody's job is to water them and prune them and harvest them and do something with the harvest, right? We need to be looking at our public spaces in a way that takes care of us. So permaculture is based on ethics. Our ethics are to care for the planet. Can we in our everyday decisions and everyday life not damage the planet? Who damaged the planet today? Right? Who's going to damage the planet tomorrow? Okay. So the second ethic of permaculture is, is to care for people, to care for each other. How do we by design take care of each other? If we don't, by design, take care of each other, people will just take care of themselves. Like, you know, you have a family of five, you gotta feed them, right? You're gonna do what you need to do. So how do we look at a design approach to human settlement in a way that really takes care of each other and looks out for each other? And then the third ethic of permaculture is to share our surplus. And your surplus might be knowledge, and your surplus might be water, and your surplus might be seeds, and your surplus might be tools. Right? How do we get out there and share what we have in a culture that encourages us to be very, very selfish and to consume as much as possible? You know, my favorite example there is the Lay's potato chip had a, an advertising campaign which was, get your own bag. Like, 
don't even share your potato chips, okay? That's pathetic. And so like, how do we encourage people in a culture of, I'm gonna have all my own stuff and I'm not gonna even let you borrow it to, wow, look what I have, what do you have? Let's see if we can figure out how to share what we have. So those are the ethics of permaculture. And then that's backed up by a whole series of principles that are sort of the, the path forward so that we can put those into action. I'm kind of, um, at the stage of my career, I work on very large projects and very small projects both, and I'm into the implementation phase. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm not just a theorist or a philosopher. I want to see phase two. I want to see us building those trellises and planting the food and working with our governments on food security issues and how do we hyper-localize our communities. And so this is a great project in Seattle. The goal was to mitigate stormwater runoff. Okay, we have in a big storm surge, it overtaxes our sewage system, raw sewage goes out into the bay, and it damages the salmon run. Okay, we are federally mandated to fix this problem. So this was a street, this is um, a pattern in nature, rather than a straight line of a street, we're looking at a meander, right? And every person in this block had to buy in. So they took out the curbs and they put in a series of rain gardens. Can you see where there's rain gardens going down? So a rain garden is gonna have biodiverse habitat for everything from frogs to dragonflies. They're gonna have a huge amount of different kinds of plants, right? So the rain water is gonna go, the, all the water from the street is being diverted into these rain gardens, right? They had 98% stormwater mitigation and they got huge biodiverse habitat and beautiful plants and the neighbors go out and walk down the street and get to know each other and the cars drive slower so there's less accidents on the road and the crime rate grows down, okay? So how do we stack functions? How do we look at trying to build one solution for stormwater runoff and end up actually bioremediating the pollution from the oil in the street and build community, right? So, in, so what we're trying to do in permaculture is look at how can we put as many functions onto one element as we possibly can? What, what are the many cascading benefits we can get from one solution, right? So this is called the C Streets. You can look up this project. And again, why is it the only one? Why do we only have one of these? Right? Why don't we have hundreds of these? Um, Portland and Seattle both are very aggressively putting rain gardens in all over the cities. And they're very beautiful. And they're very, very effective. How long is it's like one city block. Okay? So this is a bus stop. Okay? So we're looking at like the eddies of human life. Why can't you sit and have a chin wag at the bus stop? Like how many people go to the bus stop and go like this? Like, and you really don't even want to like acknowledge the person next to you. You're so uncomfortable with that stranger standing there. So in the Food Forest Project, which I'm about to get into, um, I actually designed a bus stop edible guild of plants so that people standing at the bus stop can eat berries that are seasonally going to be delicious. Okay, right? So like, how do we, how do we as designers take care of people? Right? Why, make that a daily experience where you're standing at the bus stop. We can change that, right? And I know that in some communities that this would be trashed, and I know that that's a, a sad fact. It doesn't mean that you can't do something similar, right? Like, what would work for you? And um, I was watching, actually, these kids at the, at the park adjacent to the food forest, thinking about what kind of infrastructure we needed, and I was watching these, what, high school seniors. They were, like, big, huge, gigantic 200-pound boys, and they had uh, tables that were sort of cemented into the ground, and the kids were leaping from table to table to see who could leap the most tables. And every time they landed on one at the table would go groan, you know. So I'm thinking, okay, if I build a trellis, it has to handle 200 pound guys climbing up it, right? It's like, it's not like it's a criticism, it's an observation, you know. If you put something to climb on, something will, someone will climb it, right? So here's, a, here's another little example of how we can just in little small ways enhance our community experience, right? Okay, so here's the food forest schematic. So the, the really quick backstory is I teach an international permaculture design curriculum. I do design work for clients on farms, in villages, in towns, in cities. I work with policymakers on food security issues. Um, I design edible landscapes for backyards. So my clients are very, very diverse. Um, in one design course a few years ago, some students for their final design project decided to take on this um, parks, property where they were gonna, just for fun for their to showcase what they learned in the year they did a design and they they really got excited about it and they did a great job with it 
So they went ahead after that and wrote a Department of Neighborhoods small and simple grants, and they won a $22,500 award to do a design on this property. Now the property is in the most ethnically diverse zip code in the United States, which you would, might be surprised to hear is in Seattle. So you have many different Asians, you have African Americans, recent African immigrants, um, Latinos, you know, uh, just tons of different people living here. So Koreans, Vietnamese, you know, Chinese, all different. And so we had to do a public outreach process with this community. And this was a, um, an open reservoir around very, very low income housing that went up to a barbed wire fence with blackberries. For Homeland Security, they decided to cap that reservoir and opened a 40 acre new park in this neighborhood with a playground and a community center and a Samoan cricket field and a golf driving range and, and now a permaculture food forest on the western flank. Okay, so here you have what used to be a dead zone in the city is the crossroads of this great multi-ethnic community, right? Really, I mean, creating new land in the city is impossible and here we have 40 acres of new land out of nowhere, it's a park. So we had to do this public outreach process and in Seattle we have a 3,000 person waiting list for community garden plots. We call them pea patches named after the Picardo farm family who donated the first farm for community plots. And um, I grew up in Europe, and I lived in the Soviet Union at the end of the Soviet era. And let me tell you, these little community garden plots and allotment gardens, that's what kept people alive post-war, okay? And certainly during the Cold War. And having um, people have a place to get out and grow their own food, so it's basically your private plot on public lands. So, um, so you can see on the design, there's a lot of little community garden spaces. People wanted everything. They wanted berries, they wanted orchards, they wanted edible playgrounds, they wanted pea patches, they wanted uh, outdoor classroom, they wanted bike trails, they wanted et cetera, et cetera. So um, on the lower area, I don't know if you can see it, but it says community play field. So that's a series of nut trees that on the inside is ringed with snack fruits so that when you're playing ball or having a game out there, when you get hungry, you just go over and you can eat the fruits off the trees. So snack fruits are the ones that are fresh, the most juicy and sweetest right off the tree. Unlike, for example, a storage pear, which you pick and it's hard and doesn't taste very good and you put it in cold storage and two or three months later the sugars come up and then they're sweet, right? So your plant selection really depends on what the function is. Right, so snack fruits are the yummy ones right off the tree, right? So the snack fruits. In the kids' playground area, we have nothing with thorns on it, all mini dwarf trees, and so the kids can just go and, and, and harvest whatever they want when it's ripe. Um, and then we have groves of mixed food forests. So in a food forest, what we're trying to do is mimic the forest ecosystems. We're gonna copy the pattern from nature and have big canopy overstory trees all the way down to the root zone and put in edible or functional plants in place of beautiful redwood trees or other shrubs that might grow in the forest, right? So we're using that, that nature mimic to move forward. Um, what we found with this project is that the biggest complaints are, what if people eat it all? And I'm like, well, I think we should plant some more, right? <laughs> Clearly, there's a bigger demand than we expected, and let's get some more raspberries out there. Oh, okay, what if homeless people come and eat it? I'm like, you know, I think homeless people like fruit too, right? <laughs> Isn't this a hippie's dream come true? I'm like, my dad is the biggest conservative hawk you've ever met, and he likes fresh fruit. So like these like, weird prejudices that come out that it's gonna be like, people doing drugs that are homeless are gonna move in. It's like, why wouldn't you want homeless people to come, engage with the community, and do something healthy and eat fresh food? Why would you not want that? I, I have a really hard time with that one. And so, so this project has been really exciting. Right when we finished the design, we, we had to um, get approval from a lot of people. And when we finished the design, they were awarded a $100,000 grant through the parks levy because of the community gardens we had there. That money had already been voted in and was waiting for those 3,000 waiting list pea patch sites. Okay, so here's my stakeholder list. I'm going to read them off because we had to work with the steering committee, the people who actually put the project together, um, the multi-ethnic community, the Department of Neighborhoods, Seattle Public Utilities. Public utilities are a huge organization with an incredible amount of power. 
They have a lot of land, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of responsibility, and they're, they're used to getting their way. And so it was an interesting one. We had water quality, the trust, Seattle parks, et cetera, et cetera. And of course the land is our first client, right? Gaia, Gaia is the number one client. And so we have to always consider the land whenever we're working on any project. But what was interesting about public utilities, and I don't usually share this story because it's a little inflammatory, my first meeting with public utilities was up on the 45th floor with me and the landscape architect and one of the heads of the departments there, quite high up in the organization. And her f opening comment was, do not mistake me, smacking her finger on the table. We will not allow a loose association of peasants to manage this project. <laughs> opening comment. And I thought, well, We'll just have a real tight association of peasants, right? You know, so how do I, what do I do with that, you know? And so I, I, you know, took copious notes. She was very adamant that we should drop the project. And it turns out that you know, Seattle has an interdepartmental team from all the city families. We have parks and utilities and city council and all the different city groups who had just recently formed this interdepartmental team on food security and food justice right on the heels of the year of urban agriculture and public utilities had a person at that table. So I went to my insider guy and I said, what do I do? He said, I'll take care of it. So she was sort of sidelined at that point and Carl, who was one of the original founders of Seattle Tilt, which is a well-known national organization now, um, he came in in her stead and he's dedicated his career to curbside recycling, composting, pick up at the curb, you know, all the systems that we have in Seattle that many other cities still don't have. He's been in 25 years working in public utilities putting, putting these programs together. So he helped us move it forward. So it was a very interesting um, acting professionally in a really diverse stakeholder group is one of the things we have to do as resiliency experts to get the seat at the table to help people to think differently. So we have to satisfy these different groups and we have to understand what their needs and wants are so that we can address them and not belittle them or not um, shunt them aside. We have, to, we have to engage with them really actively and, and allay their concerns, right? So an edible forest garden, so I'm gonna just zip through these. You know, we're looking at, for a lot of people, it's a wall of green. You know, For me, I'm a plant expert, right? I have a huge amount of horticultural knowledge. I look at that and I can see you know, 50 different things I can eat in there, right? So um, I just hosted the man who wrote these books for a, a 10 day f edible forest garden design intensive with um, some pretty stunning students and um, learning a lot. So here's a quick look at the different layers of the forest. Right? So how are we trying to mimic that forest ecosystem to get us the highest yields? And it turns out, of course, that in a monoculture, you're often, um, so you're planting one kind of crop in a, in a tilled up field, so you're interrupting the soil food web in the ground. You're often using chemicals and pesticides in genetically engineered projects. Please vote on Prop 37. Um, so, so it turns out there's a higher yields overall when you have a polyculture, right? Different things photosynthesize at different rates depending on where they are in the landscape. So if you have some plants that are filling that lower ground cover, they're shading the ground, they're providing habitat for predator insects, they have deep tap roots that are bringing up minerals from the subsurface, and they're sharing water resources, Right? So we're looking at how do we use the resources in a landscape for the highest overall yield. Right? So a garden is four times more productive than a farm. Well, why is that? It's because we have all these diverse yields, but also because some of it's like vertical, some of it's at eye level, right? And some of it is um, stuff that we're gonna use on a homestead basis. Even in an urban setting, we can still grow stunning amounts of food on an eighth of an acre. I do it, I grow tons of food in the city. Absolutely stunning amounts of food in the city. Okay, so here's an aerial view, an, a bird's eye view of a pea patch, right, of a, of a community garden space. So those of you who, who have seen these in other places, maybe you've been on a train driving out of the station in Italy or Germany and you've seen these incredible gardens that people have. But what I love about this shot is that everybody's garden is really different. Right? Some are little straight rows, some have little patios with chairs, some are a hob you know, just a hodgepodge of all kinds of things. And yet here is this like intersection of our community, all with the same sharing a passion for growing food. Yeah. Where? This one, um, I, I don't know where this one is. Someone gave me this shot. So I don't know I don't know if this is a Seattle shot or not. But uh, yeah. 
Okay, so what do we get when we have community food? You get kids knowing where their fruit comes from. I had an argument with a 12-year-old about where apples came from. I mean, who didn't read a book with a farm book with little apples on the trees? And I met, made a comment, like, I gotta go, um, I gotta harvest apples from the trees. And the kid said, apples don't come from trees. And I said, well, where do apples come from? He's like, apples come from the store. And I, like, and, and then I said, that's, well, how do you, what, what do you mean? And he said, mom, Jenny's making fun of me. She says apples come from trees. And the mom comes in. Like this, you know. So and so this like absolutely stunning disconnect of where our food comes from, right? It's appalling to me. And so I look at you know how do we not only help people get that connection back, but where is the skill set that you're gonna? What are you gonna? What do you bring to the table? You can't have a table that is full to overflowing unless you bring something to the table. All right. As Americans in this culture, we are used to somebody else growing the food, preparing it, setting the table, we belly up and stuff ourselves and leave someone else to do the dishes. Like those days are over, folks. You've got to learn how to bring something to the table, okay? And I don't really care what it is. I don't care if you're a songwriter. I don't care if you knit. I don't care if you make cheese. I don't care if you bring your mint tea from your backyard, right? But bring something to the table, okay? Learn how to use tools. Learn how to save seeds. Learn how to organize your neighbors, right? Learn how to affect policy so you can grow food in your neighborhood, right? Figure out what it is that you want to learn about and start to learn it, okay? So here we have kids getting out, families in the city, okay? Seniors are often, um, when they have garden plot, they're out there almost every day. And what's really great about having seniors in the project is that we call it sort of eyes on the project. When you have people there seven days a week, the incidents of vandalism go way, way, way down, right? And so I had, um, in the Food Force Project, a high school teacher from the school down the road said, I'm doing a you know, juniors and seniors horticulture project. Would it be possible maybe if we could work on this project? <laughs> Oh yeah, this is exactly who we're doing it for. Right up the hill is the Veterans Hospital, and so we're now working with the Veterans Administration. They're gonna do a garden therapy class where they're gonna come for PTSD counseling, walk down to the garden, about 20 minutes, work in the garden for an hour and a half, walk back. So it turns out that in really healthy, bioactive, lush, rich soil, that there's bacteria in that soil that when you get your hands in it, it actually has a symbiotic relationship with humans and it releases dopamine in the brain, okay? So getting your hands in healthy soil actually makes you happy, like physically makes you happy, right? Okay, those are kiwis in New York City on a trellis. Okay, so kiwi fruit um, comes from China and used to be called a Chinese gooseberry and the fuzzy kiwis are uh, very, very easy to grow. You pick them in November and then they come ripe in January, February. So it's like a super high vitamin C, delicious winter fruit, so we can reduce our carbon footprint by not having to ship vitamin C in from outside of our area, right? Once kiwis start to produce, they have bushels and bushels and bushels of fruit on them, like an unbelievable amount of yield on those. Here's harvesting persimmons. Persimmons also grow in Seattle, right? And this is what I want. Like, this is like the classic, you know, white kid from England who's never been out of the city in his undies, like harvesting berries and has never, you know, oh my gosh, look at all these berries. So we want to get the kids out there. Like, I want kids to have that experience where they can, like, eating so many berries that you can't eat anymore, like that you've just stuffed yourself. And, like, you know, eating so much fruit that you can't, you can't fit one more plum in your body. Like, that's a great experience for everybody to have. <laughs> and I think that, you know, for those of you who are renters or are, are, are transient in nature, you have to delight in the idea idea that you planted a plum tree and you're never going to eat the fruit and that juice is going to drip down someone else's chin right I mean you've got to like give over that it's not about you right you have all of us have a legacy responsibility I don't care if you're young or old right if you're in the legacy phase of your life you can still plant thousands of trees in your time right if you're a younger person you know figure out if you like raspberries Raspberries about it, the easiest plant on the planet to propagate, right? They send up new little shoots all by themselves. You just dig them up and stick them in the ground over there, right? So how do we get people excited about that? You know, how do we get the kids out there, you know, 
Who in a low-income family can afford to buy raspberries for $6? Guess what? You don't get any raspberries. So why can't we just grow them? Why can't we have our parks employees who are paid taxpayer dollars to mow and mulch and put down wood chips to be planting raspberries? It's publicly funded jobs. Wouldn't you, as a parks employee, really enjoy the fact that you just planted a bunch of raspberries that the kids in your neighborhood are going to eat? Right? So what it is about our jobs, how do we, how do we reinvigorate some of these jobs with a purpose? That's serving our hyper-local economy, right? Okay, so a mature walnut can yield 30 bushels of nuts. Why aren't these in our parks? Right? So there's a great Chinese saying, like the, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, and the next best time is today. Okay? So these take many years before they're producing this kind of yield, but you know, in five or six or seven or eight year, years, you can have walnuts and hazelnuts and chestnuts and like the amount of nuts we can be producing in these on the commons is pretty amazing, right? So here's a classic permaculture sort of annuals garden. You've got, um, we're looking at sort of using time and space. So we're looking at the um, different plants grow at different heights and grow at different times of the year. And so we're filling in all the niches. There's never any bare dirt in my garden, right? So how do we, you know, have, we have squash and corn and beans and peas and mint and um, things for uh, pollen plants for the bees. So those of you who um, aren't in the know about colony collapse disorder, we're having a global collapse of honeybee colonies. Global, absolutely frightening prospect that the main pollinators of most of the food that we eat are dying at a colossal rate in the last five years and getting worse every single year. This is a, this is a, 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 a tragedy in the making. This is a famine in the making right around us and why is it happening? And so we have a responsibility to plant flowers and nectaries and insectaries in every little inch of space that we can find to support the honeybees, right? And I think for farmers, for example, in the almond crop, I think is in California, it's a giant monoculture of chemically treated nut orchards, and they ship the honeybees in on trucks wrapped in plastic, and they feed them on sugar water. So this, the, guy, the guy described it as, Yes, your, your um, lineage would be pretty weak, too, if for the last 20 generations you'd be fed only on Twinkies, okay? So, you know, it weakens you after a while. They don't even let them have their own honey. So why can't they, in those almond orchards, take out every 10th row and put in gigantic insectaries and just have year-round bees there? Right? They don't want their production to go down. So in the, in the interests of maximizing your chemical product, to market, you are sacrificing things like honeybees, which may, in the end, sacrifice us. So get your priorities straight, all right? Okay, so Seattle in the year 2010 had the year of urban agriculture, and we passed a whole bunch of laws. You can grow food in your planting strip. You can sell things out of your backyard. You can have a neighborhood farm stand right, right there on, on in front of your house. You can sell seeds and produce and dried herbs, and we also passed a whole bunch of new cottage food laws. You can prepare things in your non-commercial kitchen for sale. Some things you can't do, but some things you can, right? You can't do dairy, that one's pretty obvious, but you can bake bread, right? So, um, so how do we create this local economy? I really believe in cottage industry. If you can make 5% of your income doing something in this realm, and have a skill, obviously, because you're getting it to market, so you grew it, you harvested it, you made it, you built it. If you need to scale it up, you can, right? If you need to go from five to 15 or 20% of your income, you have that baseline skill to, to grow from. If you don't have that baseline skill, it's pretty hard to scale it up, right? So how do we get people excited about that? And I think earning income on it is one classic way. Um, in Seattle, we also said that developers get a whole extra floor that they can build if they put a greenhouse on the roof. Okay, so this is a greenhouse in New York City, green jobs in the city. This greenhouse is um, exclusively for one grocery store in New York. Okay, that's a nice job to have in the city, in a brightly lit, warm place, dealing with plants and feeding your local community. I'd feel good about that, right? 
Okay, keeping bees. Um, I work with a guy who has a, a company called the Urban Bee Company, and we have a small business called Honeyscapes, and people that want to keep bees in the city, they have to have the pollinator landscape that goes alongside it. So when they want to get the bees, they also have to get a permaculture design alongside it. And bees also need water, fresh water every day. We changed the rule from three chickens to eight chickens in the backyard. So you can have, you know, three chickens is actually quite a lot of eggs. Eight chickens is a lot of eggs, right? You can't have a rooster. And so what's happening is in these little, you know, small pockets in our backyards, people are growing meat birds and having huge egg production, and then they barter. I bartered my neighbor eggs for beans or whatever I had in abundance in my garden. They would trade me eggs. From my, and I can watch the chickens out my window. Like, I know the chickens. So, um, so that's kind of a, a, a neat way to do it and um what else i got kids in the garden right you got to get the kids outside kids love working in the garden it they and they want to do what you do right so you have to model it and this is the piece i think a lot of folks miss is that oh why are my kids like they're so addicted to video games i'm like oh, how much time do you spend on the computer right so they want to do what you do if you're out in the garden and the you know, kids are like look at the worms wow they look here's your here's kid sized shovels to work with right Kids love it. They love getting their hands in the dirt. They, they, when the fruit is on, the kids know where the fruit is, right? I don't know that the raspberries or the strawberries are ready until I see the four-year-old with the red, you know, mush. And so that's when I know that the strawberries are ready. Like they instantly can find fruit anywhere, right? Okay, so these are other animals you can have in the city. Great little livestock opportunities. Um, ducks, uh, little pot pigs are excellent for turning the compost, right? They're really intelligent little creatures. And then um, I have some friends who have goats in the city, the pygmy goats, and they have a pretty big milk harvest. You know, they milk their goats twice a day. So you, you, have, you are allowed to have different livestock in the city. So the classic ones are chickens, ducks, goats, bees, right? Uh, bunnies, bunnies are really classic ones. Okay, so this is coppicing. So this is just jumping into another way of looking at how we manage our resources around us. So coppicing is when you let a tree grow from its root and you cut it at the base, but you leave the roots, right? And then the next year it sends out new shoots or sprouts and then you harvest them on a particular rotation. So this is a willow harvest. So every three years or less, two to three to four years, you go in and harvest the willow whips. Well, what do you use willow for, right? But what's happening underground? The roots are growing and growing and growing, right? So you have coppice systems that have three and 400 year old root systems. They're gigantic. So they um, are able to stabilize eroding banks or to be part of a riparian buffer zone or um, sequester carbon, right? So we're looking at all the different stacking of functions that we have. If you put it on like an eight year rotation for sweet chestnut, you're gonna have bigger logs that you can use in building furniture or building houses. Right? So all over Europe, they have coppice agroforestry systems that, of course, require a whole different skill set. Right? So what they do in England, for example, I'm the landowner, my coppice is coming into its rotation of 12 years, it goes to auction. So the timber cruisers come out and they bid on it at the highest price, and then there's a contract that's centuries old that says they must leave the land in this condition after they've taken all the wood. And then 12 years later, you get another harvest, right? So all over Europe, we have these highly developed coppice and pollarding agroforestry systems. So um, we're trying to recreate some of that. Um, so here's you know, what it looks like when you, after you've harvested it. And here's some of the products. So you can build baskets, you can do thatched roofs, you can build brooms. Um, there's a, a company in England that builds charcoal pencils. So he's got a, a special little bake oven that at high temperature turns it into charcoal pencils. I'm sure you've all at some point bought a little box of those. He makes $40,000 an acre. Okay. So, um, and then willow also is what aspirin comes from. Right? So it's a, it's a pain-killing medicine. And it also has a rooting hormone that if you soak the bark in water, when you go to transplant things, you put it in that rooting hormone water, and it'll help the plant to establish itself much better. Right? So all kinds of functions for willow. These are the big um, bundles are live stakes. And so willow grows like this. 
you stick it in the ground and walk away, right? It's about the easiest thing in the world to grow. So you can sell live stakes to other farmers or to other properties, right? So if you have a wet area, willow is an excellent plant to put in there. It's also beautiful. It could be red and green and yellow and you know, all the different colors. Okay, so this is a project in Portland. I was recently um, brought down to the city to talk to two different groups. One was city government, so um, planning and development, uh, 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 transportation officials, people from all different uh, walks of government life. And I said to them, you know, you're gonna get citizens coming to you with proposals to do initiatives on the commons, on the public lands. And it's your responsibility to figure out how to facilitate that. You know, at this peak moment, pick your peak. Is it, is it peak oil? Is it peak water? Is it peak population? Is it peak ecocide? Is it peak overfishing of the waters, right? Is it peak privatization of water? Like, what's your peak? I don't know what your peak is. Mine is kind of the confluence of peaks. I am looking at a seven billion population that if we go up to nine billion, what does it look like? We just went from the dawn of humanity to 1850 and had a billion people on the planet. In the last 150 years, we went up to 7 billion people. You know, 95% of everything that's ever been built, extracted, manufactured, or mined has happened in the last 50 years. That is my lifetime. I am 49 years old. 95% of everything, every fork, every computer, every stand, every microphone, right? We just did it. We are extracting the, the death out of this planet, okay? The life, the life force of this planet, we are munching it down in our plastic cups that we throw away every day because you're too lazy to wash a glass, right? So, I, I, so I'm trying to challenge these city governments to look at it. Your responsibility is to take legislation off the books that restricts us from doing this and to facilitate new legislation that helps us move it forward. If you need to call it a pilot project, great. Call it a pilot project. And so this is a pro these are some friends of mine um, who started a group called City Repair in the Village Building Convergence, a very well-known international event where they bring natural builders and urban planners and all kinds of people together for 10 days and do natural building projects all throughout Portland. And this group is um, taking a, a neighborhood called the Selwood Gap, and there's a uh, one piece of a gigantically long bike trail that for some strange reason this last little piece is a private railroad chunk that's owned by an individual who's about to turn it over to the community. And so they want to put community gardens, play fields, food forests, and all kinds of things all in this edge for this community and they've engaged the community in a really um, inclusive decision-making process of how to move it forward and what do they want. And so I went to the city to facilitate this um, discussion of, you're gonna start getting these projects landing on your desk, what are, you gonna, what are you gonna do, say no? You're cutting staff and budgets right and left for management of the commons, you can't keep up. And now you have citizens coming and saying that we want them to do our own things with, how are you gonna do that in this peak moment? What's your job here? And so um, they're very interested in that. So um, this project is moving ahead very quickly now. So here's for you guys down in the south. This is my friend Brad Lancaster. He's written three books called Rainwater Harvesting, um, all different kinds of techniques. And what he's done is he bought this house for about $30,000 in a really, really rough and tough neighborhood in Phoenix. And the sidewalk is a big, very, very wide sidewalk of just gravel. It is hot and sear and dangerous and a lot of, you know, you gotta watch your back in that neighborhood. So he started putting in gray water uh, harvesting features on his house. So his laundry and his shower and his kitchen sink, all these gardens are swales, which means that there are depression in the ground. So the water goes down into them and they fill it with mulch of all different kinds and you can plant stuff in that, right? So you have every day that you take a shower, you're watering your garden. Every day that you turn the sink on in your kitchen, you're watering your garden. Every time you do your laundry, right? So basically, I don't really want to hear about how there's no water in the desert. The average American uses 75 gallons of potable water a day each. That is shocking number. And so what are you doing with that? You're basically taking it from its highest source of, you know, use potable water, and you're flushing it when you pee, like, hello, this is ridiculous. People in the world don't have fresh water to drink. So how do we value that water resource? How do we reuse it in our landscape as many times as absolutely possible before it goes down into that system? 
right? So what, they, what Brad did was he illegally cut curbs and built basins in that dry landscape sidewalk, right? So every time it rained, the rain would be diverted off the, the curb and into these little tree wells, right? And he started to plant mesquite trees and all kinds of native habitat. And he's got, I don't have his series of photos, but he has a series of photos year by year. And then instead of putting a straight sidewalk path, he put a meander in, okay? So now I think seven or eight years later, this $30,000 house is worth a significant amount more money. But even more importantly, they have all kinds of birds and insects and animals living in that landscape. It is the gathering place for the neighborhood. They have, um, every couple months, they have, for example, mesquite honey pancake breakfast, and they make the flour out of the nuts that grow in the trees. And so here's just one man's vision of how to reincorporate water into a landscape that some ridiculous urban planner decided that in the dry desert, we're going to design our cities so the water goes away as fast as it absolutely can and doesn't stay here. Right? That is dumb. So how do we look at that urban design and, and rethink it in a way that keeps that water in our landscapes? So in, in Brad City, any new construction must have a gray water stub out. It is required by law. Okay? Um, it's a $40 permit to cut your curb. Right? So they encourage people now to do it. So one person's sort of little civil disobedience act l l turned into legislation, right? So just really quickly, he's got a passive solar hot water, a solar cooker, active solar panels on the roof, and all these gardens are um, fed by his gray water system. Okay, this is Amsterdam, right? Is it cold in the winter in Amsterdam? It's really cold. It's slushy and icy and snowy and cold, and everybody commutes by bike. And as a city planner, you have to have thousands of bike parking spaces, right? Do we have that here? No. Why not? Why not? Why don't we have that? Why aren't we looking at solutions that care for people, right, and care for the planet? All these people aren't driving. Isn't that nice, all right? So we have to think it through in a really more comprehensive way. Okay, here's a straw bale. So here's the thing I love about natural building. It may cost you less, but it's very labor intensive, which means you have to have some skills, right? So, but it, you can do it yourself. Like people forget how great it feels to build your own home. I built this home. I grew that salad. Like if you've ever grown food and taken it to your friend's house for dinner, like how does it feel? You're like, that comes from my backyard, you know? Like, you're like, you're so, you know, full of yourself, and you should be, right? Like that, taking pride in that is really important. When you fill a role in your community that hasn't been filled before, you feel differently about yourself. You're an important person in your human landscape, right? If you get up in the morning, get in a car, drive an hour to work, hate your job, it's a middle management at some stupid company that isn't doing anything that's, you know, just you know, making games, and you come home and your kids are playing video games and then you go out for dinner because you're just too tired to eat and the food you're eating is GMO crap, right? Guess what? You feel really shitty inside. I'm sorry. Like, it's like get, get a grip on what it means to be, uh, stand up in your community and take responsibility for that. So I don't mean to be, to be rude. I'm just, I'm just trying to give you that push. Like, it feels really great to have those skills. It feels really great to offer that to your community. Okay. I got the five minute flash. So really quickly, this is a design that I did for Evergreen State College, just so you really, you can know what fits in two acres. Okay, it's about 1.75 acres. So food forests, um, outdoor classroom, indoor classroom, compost front and center, right? Rather than putting it off in the corner where it doesn't get taken care of, right? So here's a yurt classroom. Here's a, a greenhouse with a cob wall right? And the chickens inside. Chickens generate an enormous amount of heat. If you bring them in the greenhouse in the winter, you can extend your growing season one, two, three, four weeks a year. That's a month out of the year, extra growing season is pretty good. A pizza oven, an insectary, a nectary. If I were a bee, this is where I would be hanging out, right? Um, community garden plots, getting people outdoors. Um, okay, so this is all, I'm going to end on this little section here, okay? So I was asked to sit on an advisory team to city council on carbon neutral food. 
And so we had to do an analysis of what is the most carbon-laced food you can buy. Okay, so uh, let's see, chemically grown cherries from Chile air freighted in in January. Okay, that's right up there with really high carbon footprint, right? So low, the, the lowest carbon footprint is neighborhood food, right? The next lowest one is uh, farmers right in your bioregion, right? And it turns out it's a lower carbon footprint to buy organic food from far away than from non-organic food from nearby. Okay, so we have to look at our food shed and our water shed and our fiber shed and we have to look at, look at our bioregion. For me in Seattle, you guys are my bioregional trading partner, right? And I'm looking to develop that. So we had to come up with action items. How do we get the city to, what do we want the city to do to support us in these efforts? So we want them to support food production on different types of properties, okay? We want more urban farming and small business classes. How does the city participate in that? This, was our, this is what we wanted from them. We want to map and publicize all the potential garden sites. Portland did that. Portland did a study of all the available land and there were acres of it within the city. And it was not allowed to have farming done on it. So the group that mapped it followed through and then removed that law, right? So we wanna know where those spots are. We want a separate meter for agricultural water. When you pay for water, you're also paying for sewage. This is not going to the water treatment plant, right? This is going in the ground where we're recharging the water table in our cities, right? So all good stuff. So how do we get them to have a separate meter for ag water in the city, right? We want leadership, we want education, we want people to understand the organic food equation. And I'm gonna add to that the genetically modified equation, okay? That is really important. We want um, a carbon neutral shopper's guide. Why is it that the immigrant farm workers are wearing biohazard suits in California in the strawberry patches? Do you really wanna eat that? Okay, we wanna identify green jobs. I cannot find a gray water plumber in Seattle. There isn't one. I cannot find a permaculture architect in my city. I have to go to Portland, okay? Where are the green, the leaders in green jobs? And how do we bring more people to those tables? Um, parks have a role to play, I've already talked about that. Um, we want, okay, I already mentioned that. Um, commercial kitchens, where people can do value-added products that they can sell. Right? So this is from Growing Power in um, Milwaukee. Will Allen is just an, an incredible person doing incredible projects, working with all kinds of kids in the city. They have a two acre site, they have livestock, they have year round food, they have aquaponics, right? So he's great. Okay, we wanna adopt guidelines and create incentives at every scale for food production that sequesters carbon, okay? That's a, a, that's a longer talk, you can ask me about that later. Okay, eat grass-fed meat. If you're gonna eat meat, that's great. Don't eat meat that's been raised in a feedlot and shot full of antibiotics and is fed up to its knees and feces with no shade that goes to an abattoir and is cruelly slaughtered. Like, eat responsible meat, that's all, if you're gonna eat meat. Um, buy local. Okay, so this is the, so hire a food czar to put it all together. So of the 12 action items that we recommended to city council, they invited us back to council chambers to go into more detail, and in the last two years, they've already enacted seven of them. Okay? Okay. Kids love to help. Okay. How many microorganisms are in a teaspoon of active, healthy soil? Anybody? Billions. Billions of microorganisms. Billions and billions. If you are standing in a healthy forest floor, you have three miles of mycelium under each foot and billions of microorganisms. We are not alone. So how do we like feed that ecosystem and how do we honor that ecosystem in a reverent way, right? How do we do that? How do we reconnect to that? And then this is my guy. So this is my son. Um, he's now five. We go every year to the barter fair where about 5,000 people come down out of the hills. We joke that it's where the 
hippies, the rednecks, and the Indians all get together and have a party and get along. Um, but we trade stunning amounts of stuff, right? So this is my friend trading his squash, but we come home with soap and candles and produce and grains and um, homemade clothes and used clothes and toy, kids trade their toys. And so this is, a, this is a, one of, again, those eddies of human life where we're trading. Plenty of money changes hands too, but we play music and we sing songs and we get together and we talk story and, and we, the kids run around and there's no cars. It's all like um, straw lanes throughout this whole village that we create for several days where we come to trade our goods for the winter. I come home with a van load of stuff for the winter. Right? So how do, we, how do we connect to that? So I just want to end with saying that you know, in my world, I work on projects. I'm going to be heading down to Suriname to be doing a whole village design down there. I work on uh, farms where we're doing biodynamics and bringing permaculture perennial edges to monoculture farms so that we can help them with their pollinator equations and help diversify their incomes through different types of crops. We're looking long term. Um, I think that the key to where we're headed in this peak moment is super decentralizing of our communities and interdependent reliance on each other when we have those skills to bring to the table. And we have to think about that hyper-local, decentralized, skilled communities where you know your neighbors, right? That's what I want, that's where I wanna live. And that's what I'm building in my community, and you can too. You just have to do it, you just have to get started. And just start small and then have a lot of fun. That's, that's what I like to do. So thanks so much.